cordial way. Are we supposed to talk to people in a cordial way? People who lie, people who slander, people who try and make huge accusations on people. And this is the desperation of people like this. That fundamentally, people like this, they cannot exist without us. His existence is dependent upon a host because he is a parasite. He's a parasite with a very nice hat. And what we got to recognize, what we got to recognize is we will not give time, not a moment to people who are slanderers and liars. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. There's no time for a second mic. There's, am I just going to be mic'd up with loads of different things? Look fundamentally. What is the message of Islam? And this is a perfect opportunity, actually. What is the message of Islam? It is a message of there's only one creator worthy of worship. Hi, Pavlo, how are you doing? See, someone like this, I don't mind talking to. Why? Because there's reciprocation. There's mutual respect. But someone like that, we will not speak to. Someone who lies and slanders. Ultimately, ultimately, we as Muslims, we believe that there's one creator worthy of worship. Pablo, come a bit more forward, I want to have a conversation with you. This is somebody worth having a conversation with. All right. How are you doing? All right? How's it going? How's it going? I like your thank shirt. You. Thank you. Thank you. It was a friend of mine called Christian who made it. If you want to make him to make a shirt to you, then I'll speak to him. So okay. I don't mind. Can you get slightly back? Because I'm going to be projecting my voice. So I don't mind having discussions with people that are civil, people that are rational, people that have mutual respect, like Pavlo. So Pavlo, let's have a discussion. You believe in agnosticism? Uh, yes, you could say it that way. Okay, I'm a Muslim. So let's have a discussion which worldview makes more sense. Okay. Agnosticism or Islam. So I'm going to give it over to you. Why do you think agnosticism makes more sense than Islam? I think agnosticism is likelier than Islam. Because it's lighter. Likelier. 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 Like, uh, agnosticism is likelier to be the answer to the questions that I have in my life. Because uh, Islam is, uh, you know, just like any other religion, it claims to have all the truth on the grasp of the hand. You can look at the Quran and you can find out all the truth. I don't believe that finding the truth is as simple as that. I think uh, the best choice for people to take, the best choice for a society to take, changes from environment to environment. I don't think just one book can be the answer to all the different possibilities, and to all the different problems that could be offered to a society. So I don't think one book can answer everything, basically. Okay. So, a quick thing that you said is, firstly, that Islam is something which claims to have the answers to everything. Now, Islam gives you the answers to existentialism, which is why we exist, okay? It's not there to give you an answer to what is the best model to understand quantum mechanics, right? It's not there to tell you is many worlds better than Copernican or whatever, right? So Islam is there to answer those basic questions. Now, in regards to, you said, we have to adapt to our environment, right? But isn't it the case that we create the environment? We create culture and culture feeds back to us in a positive feedback loop. But ultimately, your values and collectively our values create the culture. So environment, if we were to get our guidance from environment rather than from the creator, then our environment would tell us a different set of morals for one century and a different set of morals for another century and there'd be no way of adjudicating between centuries. That's exactly how it is. There's different morals in different timelines. You know, in one timeline and in one place. In one time, in one place, something can uh, be accepted as uh, acceptable by yep. society. Yep. And in another timeline, it will be seen as abhorrent. You know what I mean? Uh, different cultures. You know, there's some warrior cultures in which dying in combat is the main thing, the main important thing. So they're warlike. They're definitely not peaceful. Yep. But they have things like, for example, honor, blah, 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 all of those things that are seen as positive. And yet, they're, they have things that are seen as negative too, you know? It all depends on the environment because it's uh, it's mutual. It's as you said, because we also shape the environment. I mean, look around us. Yep. The environment has been reshaped by humans, but humans also are influenced by the environment. 
And that's what creates culture. It's the relation between humans and the environment. I think that's what creates religion, I think. Okay. So if what you're saying is true, there's no way of adjudicating between one set of morals and another set of morals because it's just contingent on whatever is the flavor of the day. So as an example, if we go back to, you said you were from which country again? Ukraine. Ukraine. So let's go back to Ukraine, say, 50 years ago. Would you say there would be a big problem with people being anti-Semitic? Right? 50 years ago. 50 years ago. And would you also say people back then had a, uh, well not 50, let's say 70 years ago during the height of the Soviet Union, that they had morals which you would today find very problematic? I think it's safe to say that, right? And their ideas on human rights collectively would be very different to the sort of ideas that you have today. Now, if you have your ideas and Ukrainians have their ideas, then in, uh, in, 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 from your perspective, how can you tell this one's true and this one's false? How can you adjudicate between the two? And the revelation from God, if something comes from God and God knows everything, then that thing is going to be objectively true. But in your case, it's just going to change according to the flavors, the trends, and the passions, and the desires of the populace at a particular time. Yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, I, I see for myself at least a way of uh, judging which uh, cultures and which ideas are better than others. It's a relation between cost and reward. You know? right. Let me get off. Uh, yeah, carry on. Everything that you do, everything you, uh, all the moves that you make in the society have a cost and a reward. You know, yep. for example, conquest. You expand your empire, you conquer other people. There, there's a cost, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be deaths, there's going to be, uh, you know, uh, abhorrent things happening. But if the reward of that society is to create a great civilization that will eventually make the lives of the people better, that will make humanity move forward, then the reward outweighs the cost in this way. Now, for example, if we look at uh, a specific cult, you know, Carthage. Carthage had a religious practice of child prostitution right. and uh, child sacrifice. It was not a positive cost-reward uh, relation because sacrificing children is such a big cost to take, such a great and abhorrent action to make that uh, the reward uh, to outweigh that is simply unachievable to humans, I would say. So we can tell, we can judge things with cost and reward. We can see what it took to achieve that. Yeah. We can see the achievement and we can make the judgment. Okay, so that perspective, that's a ut utilitarian way of looking at things. So what you're doing is you're looking at the maximum happiness and the minimum amount of suffering. Right? The maximum benefits and the minimum amount of pain. Now the problem with that perspective is we can see scenarios in which if we change the variables we'll have totally different moral outcomes. So for example, if you have someone recently, I'll give you an example. Recently um, there was a case where a woman was raped on a motorway, right? She was in the motorway, she got raped. And there was a few people involved in her rape. Now from a utilitarian point of view, if you look at that thing, you have people maximizing their pleasure and one person who's going through pain. So if we look at maximization of pleasure and minimizing of pain, then from that perspective, that would be the morally right thing to do. Conversely, say right now, I'm sure you can touch and you can feel, but say if you were someone who felt no pain, right? You actually didn't have pain receptors, you had some sort of malfunctioning, then killing you would not be uh, morally wrong in any way because it would give me pleasure and you would not feel any sort of pain. So this utilitarian way of looking at things, one, it doesn't give you an objective standard, two, it gives you absurd results, and three, there's no way of adjudicating between two different scenarios with different moral variables. Tell you what, I'm not exactly a utilitarian. Okay. Because as you said, it's as you said, utilitarians put um, feeling good, you know, pleasure as the pinnacle. I put having a few as a pinnacle, you know, the existence of the species requires that people feel some pleasure because if people exist in perpetual pain, it reduces their possibility of survival. Right. So I think pain receptors themselves, I think uh, we can agree on that. Uh, I mean, maybe not, because I would say it's a trait that was developed through evolution and epigenetics because uh, pain is useful for us to understand where we, we're getting destroyed and to prevent ourselves from being destroyed. You know, sure. the example you gave about um, uh, multiple men raping a woman. Yeah, indeed. The man will feel pleasure. The woman Would you agree from a utilitarian point of view 
You can't disagree against the argument then. I can. Because uh, uh, you're ignoring all the other people of the equation. If we allow certain men to rape a woman, yes, the group of men is more than one woman. But the whole society will suffer an exponentially bigger threat because of that. It's going to uh, remove the taboo of raping women. It's going to be the rule of the strong, not the rule of the clever, not the rule of the so you, uh, one who knows how to rule. It's going to be the rule of the ones who holds bigger strength. You know? Sure. So what you're saying is if you... This is a classical defense, right? So what you're doing, what you're saying is, if you take that example and you apply it to society, society then overall you're going to have more pain Very than pleasure. Event. However, that's assuming that firstly other people find out about the rape, because they could just kill her and get rid of the body. Yeah, they could. Secondly, that's also assuming that there's more moral good than bad in society, because you could have a society where it's kind of like, they, and there are some societies in the world in which toxic. Uh, type of behavior against women is more prevalent than others. So this is assuming all things being equal that you would have this outcome. But if we change the variables again, the scenario changes again and it gives us different outcomes. So what I'm trying to get to is this. If we look at the utilitarian point of view, or you're saying your view is a slightly different because you're looking at the, yeah, not exactly the survival of the lineage of, like of yeah. the group of populations rather than the species, the you, species. Could you, could species you could say. Okay, the, the problem with that is from a purely biological point of view, if man was red in tooth and claw and our lives were short and brutish, you know, the Hobbesian viewpoint, how do you get from that? Because it's a wonderful idea that we care about species, it's a wonderful idea. But what I'm asking for is, under your worldview, how is it actually grounded? Because I would agree with you. Because let's let's just do this. Let's get rid of utilitarianism. Let's agree the survival of the species is best. But does that fit under a agnostic worldview? Yes. Okay. It fits uh, even, I would say, under an individualistic view, which is mine. I have a selfish view. I do what I do for my own benefit. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not doing it for, you know, mumbo-jumbo, nice, goody two reasons. But there's an understanding that if you help society, society is gonna help you. If you make society prosperous, if you make society great, and if you make humanity great, it's going to be better for you. Because humanity, you know, it, it's an exchange of goods between different humans. I'm doing it for myself in the end, but doing it for myself doesn't negate the fact that it's in my interest to help the others. You know what I mean? So it's a what, simple understanding yeah, no, that I yeah, think I'm, it's very important for people yeah, to have. That the world is utilitarian, not necessarily regardless. You're saying it is utilitarian rather than it's taken a conscious utilitarian. I'm saying it's yeah, just there, 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 there is that, and what you're you basically describing is you're describing inclusive fitness. So essentially, all good can be broken down to kin selection, which is if you're or green kin selection or reciprocal altruism. So you're good to someone because they're going to be good to you eventually, or you're good to someone because they carry your genes, right? And according to some theorists, this is where good comes from. The problem, however, there is that the idea that good only comes from this type of uh, reductive bottom-up approach doesn't explain good actions that we do for which we are not reciprocated and good actions that we do that don't benefit our inclusive fitness in terms of kin selection. So for example, when you help out somebody and you give charity, most of the time today, charity is anonymous. The person that you're giving money to, he could be a free rider and free riders could take over society and society would be destroyed, right? So again, we're in the same dilemma because your worldview at the moment, at best, it's a great idea, survival of the species, but in terms of grounding it... Yeah, people don't think about it. Sorry? People don't think about it. You're the right, they don't think about they it. Don't think about it. Yeah. They like the idea, they don't think about where it's grounded. I would justify that with this, because at this point, it's not only a, a mental conclusion, at this point, uh, it's, um, it's a genetic trait. I, we spoke about this last time, you remember the example I gave about the cavemen and the wolves, blah blah blah? The cavemen who helped the others, they kept living because they helped each other. It, do, it doesn't need to happen in your head, the conclusion doesn't need to happen no, in your no, head. No, no, the thing is... Something uh, genetic. And uh, let me just say one more thing. That's where psychopaths come into play, because psychopathy is uh, from birth. It's not earned, sociopathy is earned with time, from uh, big stress through life. Psychopathy is something that comes from birth. and simply put, psychopathy is the deviation from this gene 
of um, altruism, you know, of helping others, the deviation of it. Psychopaths, uh, they sometimes are successful because uh, I, would, I would say that psychopaths eventually develop this gene of uh, deceit, of deceiving others for their own benefit, you know. Uh, but mostly, I would say, psychopaths are not clever enough to hide their, own, their, uh, their real agenda, their real uh, desires, so they get, simply get removed by evolution, by epigenetics. They simply can't coexist with humans because other humans see they won't get anything in return from helping them, you know? So it's something genetic, basic uh, gen uh, genetics in people. Uh, you see, that, if, if you say it's purely genetic, that creates another line of problems. Uh, this uh, example that you gave, I'm just uh, mentioning this example. Sure, but look, there's but you're, only... You're doing anonymous. Okay, so, so let's, let's, let's extrapolate all the possible possibilities. So there's a genetic element, there's an epigenetic in, in, uh, element in which the environment induces a gene switch, there is a behavioral en element in terms of your behavior giving you adaptive advantages, and there's a symbiotic, um, uh, symbolic or cultural element in terms of the culture, right? So that's evolution in four, dim four dimensions. Okay, the problem however is you're still back to the same issue which is only under certain conditions will it give you the outcome that we're actually looking for because there's many many scenarios in which kin selection reciprocal altruism and even if you say um, a type of altruism is a is a byproduct of this it still gives you a lot of limitation on human nature which is why i take the view that the bottom down reductive view of human nature does not fit what we actually see in the real world and that's why I don't agree with Darwinism, because I, I don't think it can explain much of human behavior. Well, again, as we, as we society, you don't think it can explain society? I, I don't think it can explain um, more than the aspects of society which fit into reciprocal relationships or things that help our inclusive fitness. I think those are the only aspects it explains, and it doesn't explain a large part of what we would call human nature. But human nature itself is flawed, so the logic that humans have to exist is necessarily also in a way flawed. It's not what I'm saying. What do you mean by flawed? flawed. It's not flawed. It's flawed. What do you mean by human nature is flawed? Um, well, simply put, humans don't know things with ab absolution, with uh, absolute certainty. They have approximations, right? Um, we have approximations that make us make uh, valid conclusions, right? Right. You know, as David Hume, he divides knowledge into three categories. Uh, you probably know about this, but let me just say it for, for the rest of the people. You know, it's um, uh, first of them is um, matters of no, not matters of fact. Relations of ideas, yeah. It's basically one plus one equals two, a triangle with three sides, the denial of which leads to self contradiction. The second one is matters of fact. For example, I'm standing right here near you. I'm standing right here with these guys, you know, we can speak, we can see each other, we can touch each other. It's dependent on our senses, and thus it's flawed just, our, just like our senses. You know, for example, secondary properties. Uh, yes. You know, if I am, for example, daltonic, then me seeing everybody, all of you around is not exactly the same way as you see. Yeah. The other the people around so senses flawed and the third one is observed regularities and it's the most flawed of all because it's predictions for the future and that's what we're doing here you know we're talking about uh, valid ways of humans uh, organizing themselves in a society I base myself not on the Quran not on the Bible I base myself on history that's the most basic thing that I base my knowledge on I see what has functioned through the course of history I see how people uh, the problems that people have had and the solutions they came up with and the a success or lack of, and I make a conclusion, this is better than this. For example, you know, if a country is in big strife, there's, uh, it's getting attacked, it's getting wrecked by other countries, it needs something. Then in that case, um, you know, a totalitarian government for that country might actually be useful yeah. for them to defend themselves. Yeah. Because that's how you get yeah. shit done quickly, right? That's how you get things done, uh, you know, immediately. Because you need to react fast. But, in times of peace, it's not that great. Because, uh, as you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yep. And eventually yep. the government becomes corrupt. You know what I mean? So, two different ideologies. You know, usually we say, oh, totalitarianism, it's evil. It's bad for times of peace. But for times where you're getting slaughtered, where you're getting killed, it's either kill or be killed. Would you say you learning more history, or us learning more history, is going to give us those lessons that we need to make us better? I'm very certain of that. Okay, so the problem I have with that alone is you can't go from what is out there to what we should be doing.
That would be the naturalistic fallacy. So this has happened. If this happened, then this happened, and historically, if, um, say for example, if Hitler did not invade Russia, uh, Soviet Union, and instead he just concentrated on the Western Front, he probably would have won the war. So, you know, knowing all these contingencies, we can't go from is to this is what we ought to do. So the problem I have with this perspective is no matter how much knowledge we gain, we will not know what to do. At best, we know what has happened. I disagree. I think we will know uh, the probability of what might work. You know, for example, Hitler started the war on two fronts, right? But at the same time, you know, the situation is very complex, especially with Hitler, because he didn't have resources, he needed to act fast, he needed to do Blitzkrieg to take over the world, basically. It was a losing situation from the very beginning. They were practically doomed. It's already strange how the Germans did so well at the war. Personally, I find it strange. But mostly it's because Stalin killed all the good generals in the Soviet Union, yeah, yeah, so yeah. they started getting slaughtered by the thousands. It's all because of Stalin, basically, that the war went so badly for the Soviet Union. But it was much more powerful than Germany, so they still won. You know? But what we can learn from this, for example, is that if you start the war on two fronts, there's a bigger likelihood that you'll lose the war. You know? Yeah, but the, all you're going to do is you're yeah. going to help a 21st century <laughs> um, warlord how not to make mistakes of the past. <laughs> not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because look, if you are facing Hitler in a war, yeah. you need to know uh, you, you can learn with Hitler. You know, you learn with everyone. But it does But that will give you nothing about the moral, uh, uh, the, the moral color of what he did that was wrong. So how can we speak if you were right or wrong? Though? Win lose, right? Omitting morality, because war. Let's face morality. It's it's blood, tears, and shit. It's, there's, there's no beauty in war. There's no, no, no beauty there's in no war. beauty in war, but there are morals. There, there are moral imperatives. There are rights. There are wrongs. There's laws of uh, what, do they, what do they call them? Uh, just war theory. These days, uh, look, people basically have uh, accepted certain rules, so they won't destroy themselves. It's basic uh, rule of self-preservation, right? There's no actual rule, but they will try to maintain those rules. So, because look, imagine this. Imagine you're fighting against. Uh, an army and you have a big victory you capture a million uh, prisoners a million soldiers and you kill them all because you want to win the war next battle they you get a million yours. soldiers captures and they and they get all killed right or two million and they get all killed yeah. uh, it's a very destructive path it's a very risky path you know so it's um, easier to it's better to go you know the more yeah, lenient but way. do you but see about morality, about, yeah. morality, about killing the jews all of that stuff i would say we can logically that it's not a good way to go either. Because, you know, for example, many of the German scientists were Jews. The Germans, you know, I have a personal theory that Hitler hated the Jews mainly because they were competition to him. They were to his, idea, to his ideology, to his, uh, um, you know, how should I say, to his right for power. You know, Hitler actually borrowed money from them and he eventually turned on them so he wouldn't give it back. He, he made the yeah, Jews the boogeyman. If, if he took the advice from history, if he could see into the future, he'd just be a worse person. He used to conquer and he did The one thing I think that Hitler, well, if he considered, he didn't pay too much attention. I don't think he paid enough attention. It's that, uh, it's what we said before, you know. You do something somebody else, somebody else, they'll be rude at you. It's uh, exchange, basically. Hitler had the idea, the idea of Aryan supremacy. He thought they could win against all odds. They couldn't. They lost. He made a gamble based on a misplaced ideology, basically. He thought he was superior, but he wasn't. And he was ruthless because he thought he was superior. The main thing, the main thing this whole situation is, if you kill people based on their ethnicity, it removes a very important taboo. Because it basically allows for which Is the social justice warriors nowadays? You know, you know the nerfs over there. The feminists who are against uh, uh, trans people. The perfect example of uh, social justice warriors fighting. Social justice I, I warriors. didn't know. Are they down there? They're they're, they're left. They've already left. Okay. But look, basically, they are judging people based on their ideology. 
disagree with us, you're not, you're not, you're evil, you're this, you're that, you're that. And they started the same witch hunt in their own ranks. It's a destructive idea from the very beginning, because it's very extremist in its very, to its very core. But then eventually, if you have he's terrific, and that's it, you get the mistake. That's why I don't like mob rule, you know, mob justice. It's very volatile, it's very volatile. One day you're ruling the mob, the next day you're getting burned by the mob. Yeah, but again, we're, we're back to the... Uh, 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 we just come back to... It's just not functional, it's not logical. We come back to the, what you were kind of, your perhaps argument is, it's gone into more a conscious group thing, rather than actually a group consensus, an unspoken known group consensus that creates these things. So it's not it's not necessarily intentional to create. Your argument might be that Islam is the structure that humans need in order to progress as a society and perhaps Well even before that I would say but, but, but any, any anything from God, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but 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 also because without Islam, you might fear or think or believe that society would descend in 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 a moral way. 